project, which is called, as you say, Bridging the Gap, which is a collaborative student led project around transition for um, A level students into first year undergrads and developing online digital resources for them. So. Um, first off, introduction. So my name is Sarah Bird. I'm an Education Outreach Officer here at Newcastle University. Just for context to explain that, because it is a bit unusual to have such a department within the academic library. So I work with local schools and we get a lot of sixth form groups in and we teach things to do with um, research skills and everything like linking in with the EPQ, which is Extended Project Qualification and AS level that people do. And this is my colleague. Hi, I'm Lawrence. I was brought in specifically as project coordinator for Bridging the Gap and I started in January. So in this session, what we're hoping to cover is basically an introduction to what our project is. So you get that overview of it. It was started through a pilot project. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So the background of it and then move on to the actual project itself. And the main focus of it will be looking at how we're doing a student led approach. So it's talked about a lot of the time, how put students at the heart of what it is that we're doing. So we'll give you examples of how we're actually doing this. And then finally, we'll share where we are now and our plans for the future. So as Sarah said, the project is completely student led and it is a collaborative project between the education outreach team, the academic skills team and other little pockets of the library as well, um, where we're creating a collection of digital study skills resources to be used by A level and students and stage one undergraduates um, that are there to build student knowledge, skills, confidence and independence and all directed by student input. So. When we say digital study skills resources, um, just to outline the kind of resources we are we are able to create and that are kind of um, encompassed within the remit of the project, we're very fortunate to be working with our digital library services team who do a lot with um, digital web resources and our uh, learning and teaching development team who have a uh, um, uh, a lot of videographers and content developers. So we're creating things that range from informa information, so web pages, downloadable PDFs, text, graphics, those, those kinds of things, uh, to videos, which uh, things like talking heads, walkthroughs of using certain software, etc., uh, and interactive, so quizzes, click-through activities, reordering exercises, basically anything that's have a go interactive. Um, and with these resources, we are aiming to cover nine areas, and these are nine areas that are within the remit of the project and our identified needs among uh, A-level students and stage one undergrads. So some of them need no explanation, some of them might, so I'll, I'll, I'll go through them. Um, so revision skills, so revising for exams, research skills, so doing uh, carrying out academic research, whether that's for your A-level coursework, an extended project qualification, or whether it's for your university assignments, communication skills, so anything from doing an academic presentation to contributing to a seminar or classroom discussion, uh, reading skills, so reading academic articles, what to do with your reading, taking notes from your reading, uh, writing skills, quite self-explanatory around writing a, a, an extended piece of writing, referencing and plagiarism, Um, refers to study related well-being so not counselling as such but anything to do with well-being and your studies and how they interact um, digital skills so using digital uh, tools to help you with your studies um, and finally glossary of terms which uh, is slightly outside of those themes um, essentially uh, one of the big things that uh, we found with our research which I'll come on to is a lot of students just want to know what words mean to, to empower them to be able to use them in conversations or, or um, take any actions. Uh, and you'll see that three of them are, are bold and the three um, bold areas are the, um, the areas we focused on in this first year of our project um, as dictated by our research. They were the three uh, most uh, commonly uh, mentioned topics. So when I started in January, we started with a big piece of research. So looking at uh, the university's academic skills kit and our a site that we uh, hold uh, A-level resources on. Um, we carried out competitive research, uh, so we looked at what we provide, what other equivalent universities um, provide, uh, what are we missing, what are other universities doing that we're maybe not, or what are we doing that we're actually maybe ahead with. Um, and then we carried out focus groups and surveys with undergraduate students and A-level students, and we also carried out interviews with academics from all of the faculties at the university uh, and teachers teaching different subjects across state and private schools and 
and we um, we essentially took all of that to the thematic analysis uh, and we uh, we ranked what came up the most, what was seen as a priority and what was seen as as uh, maybe a less of a priority. And that's how we've kind of uh, de decided on the order that we're they're working on these resources. So writing skills, reading skills and healthy study habits came up as the, the three top top results. Um, but before all of this research and before we kicked off the, the, the two year project that we're embarking on now, uh, it started with a pilot project. So our pilot project started quite small, so we were lucky enough to secure funding from the University Education Fund. So it was a small amount of funding, just around £2,000 that we got, and it was to develop some digital resources. Um, and these would be made available to basically A-level students via our Sixth Form Study Skills website and to first year undergrads, which would be via our Academic Skills Kit. So the idea is that the resources would be in content pretty much exactly the same, but might be packaged ever so slightly different to meet the needs. So that might be slight changes in language, look and that type of thing. So our two websites you can see here. So we've got the Academic Skills one on the left there. So that one's the one that is available to our own students students. Um, we do get high usage of it, so it can be around about 200,000 hits that it does get in last academic year. The one on the right there is our Sixth Form Study Skills website, which was done a number of years ago in a style that is starting to look a bit dated. So as part of this project, what we did find out is that people do like a much clearer, crisper look to it. So the revamp of it will look something along what you can see now on the screen. And again, it does have a lower reach, but it is still quite a high reach in terms of reaching um, teachers and things like that. So we get about about 120,000 um, hits that we had that last academic year as well. So the resources would sit on these two websites was the idea that we actually had. But we had to think, well, why do it now? So why at this particular time were we wanting to do this particular project? And it was really this realisation that probably everybody has is that basically your A-level student is no different to your first year undergrad student. So in some ways, people argue that actually they go back over over the summer period. So you actually have, um, they have the same issues. They have the same concerns in terms of how do you write your first essay? What is a journal? How do I reference? What's plagiarism? How do I avoid it? All of these things were the same issues that were affecting A level students as they were writing any extended um, piece of writing for their A levels. And it is exactly the same that they were feeling when they start on their first year undergrad. So that was the trends that we were seeing with that. We have noticed now again, I don't think I'm saying anything that people aren't aware of. COVID-19 has made this worse and I work a lot with teachers and they're saying this is repeatedly. So it's something that is going to get increasingly more of a problem, I think, as we move forward. So it was clear that we needed to provide something that would aid that transition and also aid it for people en masse to a certain extent, which is why we decided to go down the digital route with this particular one that we've got there. Um, as we said, we decided the website was the best place to have it. And then both teams had that shared knowledge of skills. So together we thought that we could create something that was better than what we would do individually. So that was why we decided to work together. Um, the other reasons that we've got is just looking at a different approach to this co-creation with students. So we talk about it a lot and it is something that we're very proud of that we do do a lot in education outreach, but we wanted to apply it to the side that we're doing to do with um, schools and things like this. So we wanted students to tell us exactly what they wanted uh, in what style and things like that. So that was the student co-creation with it. There's a wider library objective which collaborate, which encouraged the collaborative working. So we saw it as an opportunity where instead of working in silo, we can work together. So as I said just before, it's sort of like together we can make something better than we could separately. And then it would be professional development. We could learn from academic skills and hopefully academic skills could learn from ourselves in terms of like developing these resources and just different ways of approaching it, um, different perspectives and stuff like that. So we thought that would be something that was important. And if this works, then it would inform future practice. If it doesn't work, it will also inform future practice because we can learn from it and we can take things forward from that bit side. So what exactly do, do we mean by a student led approach? First bit of it is straightforward. So it's user led resource creation. So we did have our focus groups to begin with. So we had them with A-level students and we also had it with undergrad. It was during the um, further of times when they were 
not the strict lockdowns, but it was very hard to get hold of students to have them in a group. But we did manage it and we did manage to get what it was that they were actually wanting in it. So that was the type of resource and the look of the resource that they actually wanted. But then the second bit was the important bit as well in that we have a system at the university whereby you can hire students as part of your team. So they become interns. So we hired two JobSock students who became part of our T project team, if you like. So they literally attended our meetings. They contributed to discussions. Their um, opinions were valued and listened to. They sense checked stuff. They edited. They helped us write scripts for videos and things like this. So they're very much at the heart of the development of all of these resources. Um, I think for them themselves, it um, helped their skills. So it was a new way of working for the, us, but also for them. And it definitely helped in terms of that transition sort of careers and things like that. And I know for definite that speaking to those students since it certainly helped them in terms of getting new jobs and things like that. So here we have two lovely quotes that are from our students. So the one at the top there was the student who worked with us during the pilot project. So you can see there that she was able to develop a range of project management, teamwork, communication, problem solving. And she found that these skills are not only essential for success in academia, but also in the workplace. And by participating in this project, I've gained practical experience that will be valuable for my future career prospects. And since then, she's told me she has got a job. And in the interview, she mentioned this project a lot and she does like say that if she hadn't taken part in this project, it would have been a little more difficult to find a job she thinks as a result of it. So it's like that wasn't the main reason we did it, but it's a lovely by project that you actually have on it. And then, as I said, we're continuing working with students. So you can see the one underneath. And I think it's slightly different um, reflection, this one, which I think is a lovely look at it in that you provide an innovative and accessible resources that all students can access easily in a compassionate and understanding way and I think that's the important bit is making sure that you provide lots of different ways that people can access support for their academic skills so they have been massively affected by COVID but why should they arrive here with this huge knowledge in terms of how you put together your academic practice without someone telling them how to do it or showing them how to do it so sometimes that's in person but a lot of the time with this generation it is digital which is why we focused on the digital side of it so pilot progress so you can see it is finished the pilot but this just goes through the different stages that we actually had so focus groups that you've got Content authors and developers, so that would either be people within education outreach or it'd be people within academic skills. We would then create our first draft of those resources. They would get reviewed by the project team. So students um, were involved in the first stages, but also in this bit where they could edit it. The changes were implemented and the resources were created. So the types of resources that we created, they were limited because as I said, it was just a pilot project to develop the eight resources that you have. The main bit is that the students from the focus groups came up with these topics that they wanted it in and the main one came back again and again for time management that they actually wanted stuff. But interestingly, content wise, so what they wanted, the type of resource, sorry, the um, whether it's a quiz or a video or things like that, that was very mixed. There was no clear winners in terms of that. So it just shows that like lots of different ways in which they wanted other than it needed to be short. That was one of the other things that we've got there. So I won't go through them all, but you can get an idea of the different bits. So we tried to make sure that we had interactives in there, videos in there, just a simple PDF in there. And we could see then which ones were the ones that they actually liked the most for the different ones that we've got. And this just gives you a flavour of the type of resources. So once we created them and we had the look of them and the content, we did then go back to our focus groups and we said, well, do you like it? Do you like the look of it? And the feed that we got was a bit like where we've changed in our website is they like it clear, they like it simple, they like a more mature style and things like that because they see themselves as being the A-level but first year undergrads as well that you've got. So it's sort of this sort of style that we're going through it. So sometimes quite simple and um, like you can see on the left where it's just a quiz on the right hand side where you're thinking the learning objective there is they've got to learn, they've got to do a lot of research before they can write an essay. So we've got to think about that side of it that you've got. So reflection that we have from this is time available to dedicate to project management was underestimated. I think due in this project, we had to do it on top of what our current workloads are. Um, which is why we have Lauren now, which is just a massive, massive difference with this bit of it. So project management does take a lot of time if you can do it well. Um, the user led research, it is quicker to just do it yourself and not involve students. But do you get something better? The answer is probably no. So therefore, we put the time in to do that. And that's something that we wanted to carry on with doing on that side of it. 
Um, and then student recruitment is just thinking about how we recruit students to the focus groups, get them to be involved in the projects and then promote it later on. So achievements, it was successful. We did deliver on the project and um, pilot project exactly as we want. So we did develop those online resources. It genuinely was user led. Um, Jogstop students were part of our project management team. We collaborated across the teams um, and we got positive feedback. I hope you like the illustrations that are dotted all over our presentation. So that was one of the things that we wanted was a style that um, worked across all of them so we paid for a professional illustrator to do it but you've also got that muted mature style that you've got in the short activities which is what the focus groups has asked for and it demonstrated a clear demand like when we asked them they gave us the answers so there was stuff that they actually wanted so all of that combined meant that we did want to continue this project and look to the future so Lauren can tell you all about our two-year follow-on project. Uh, yeah, so uh, as Sarah said, uh, they fortunately secured funding for a two year project coordinator, which is me, um, and we are continuing the work of the pilot. So very much with the same aims and with that student led approach at the heart of it, um, but we're also building on it. So um, the, the pilot project had two um, student interns working on it. We've got two undergraduates working with us this year. Uh, we've got a PGR who teaches stage one. So that's someone who is at, at the call face working with stage one students uh, in seminars and lectures. Um, and we've actually got more to come in the second year of our project. We've got an advisory group made up of stakeholders across schools and, and the university. So we've got academics from the different faculties. We've got student wellbeing, student recruitment. We've got teachers. We've got school librarians. We've got a, a, hu a huge range of, of people as well as other staff in the library. We've expanded our project team, we've included more videographers and we've got more members of staff involved to share their expertise. Um, the library has invested in a project management tool for us called Teamwork, which has proven to be really useful. Uh, and the big thing is now we are, are really, really investing in uh, some independent evaluation. Um, so just to briefly touch on that, uh, we'll be evaluating three strands of our project. So on the, the first point is the project management. So you, how the project's running with the different teams involved and having a project uh, coordinator, um, kind of like keeping everything together. Is that working? Uh, the user led process. How is that working? You know, is the, is the research that we've done provided us with better resources in the end? How do the students feel about being involved? Uh, and the resources themselves, you know, once we've got the resources out there in the world, are they working? Are they getting used for a start and, and are they beneficial? Um, so uh, Sarah showed you how we were uh, running the project in the pilot, uh, quite a similar uh, sort of series of events for the for the two year project. So as you can see, we're in out year one uh, stage of resource development there. So we've done the research and the planning. We're well under underway with the resource development. We'll have the first uh, batch of resources ready in October uh, and then we'll do our year one report by December. And essentially, year two is carrying on with that great work until our website web pages are all ready. We'll launch for September 2024. We'll be promoting uh, the resources uh, then and we'll have a final report, an evaluation report and an impact report in the very end. Um, so just to sum up really some of the key things that we've done so far. So uh, we did lots of competitive research, our audits and our focus groups and interviews. Uh, we then uh, as a team sat down and worked out who wanted to do what, who was best suited to do what. Uh, we brainstormed and storyboarded everything and we began the resource development in April. And since May, all of the resources for those three topics are all being produced or are actually ready. Uh, we've been filming some videos. As you'll see on the right, that is one of our lovely student interns, Charlotte, uh, being filmed for a video on choosing the right study space. Um, and we are beginning the digital implementation of some of those interactives. We're speaking at conferences, including this one, uh, and we've been sharing successes among the team. So we like to meet and check in. And uh, it's uh, a lot of the work is, uh, is different pockets of the team. So it's really nice to come together socially and share what we're all enjoying and, and how things are going. I'm just starting to think about marketing which is a bit scary because it's quite a way off September 2024 but we want to get ahead of the game and that's it from us thank you very much thanks very much guys that was a really interesting talk um there are a couple of questions uh so I'll just go through those now uh Claire Swanick's asking this is a really great example of collaborative working I wonder whether you'd agree there is a distinction to be made between A-level and BTEC students in terms of academic needs and support required, and whether there are any plans to do something similar with BTEC transitioning students. That's a really tough first question. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, it was mainly, I'd say, we were focusing on the demand that we have for students, um, A-level students coming up. So it tends to be that it's A-level students and they're doing an EPQ, history or English or geography. 
and they tend to be the areas that we focused on. We haven't actually, in all honesty, had many requests from BTEC students to come and study with us, but I would agree they are a different student, perhaps with different needs. So it might be that it is something that if we see an increase in need and demand for it from that side of things, then we would look at something to do with that. But at the moment, the remit is that it's on looking at A-level students and it is looking at those particular areas. So, um, yeah, it might be something to consider in the future, but certainly within this one at the moment, the focus is more on those particular areas and those A-level ones. Thank you. And, and a, a similar question from Helen. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Really interesting. You talk about A-levels on your online site mentioned sixth form. Are BTEC level students or students in FE colleges targeted or supported separately? So I think you Yeah, I mean, I would say we do get a lot of requests from local colleges, but it tends again to be like people who are doing A-levels that are coming. So it's like through our local colleges, we do get a lot come in and we can go out to the college. So we don't do that. We do online sessions with them and things. But it tends to be that it is the A-level students that are asking for or the A-level teachers that are then asking for it. We, we don't know to that extent how many people are using the online resources, whether they are BTEC or whether they're A-level. So sorry, I'm not sounding like I'm offering much help for those two in VTech, but it's just like that's the request that we're having from um, our institution. Thank you. And then one from Evelyn Webster. How did you ensure the resources you created wouldn't go out of date? I think they will potentially go out of date is the honest answer so it's like going and um, we already like I said with our website the sixth form study skills one it's like it looks dated now in all honesty which is why as part of this process we're changing it and doing it and I think digital is one of those things that it does date and you do I don't know whether you've got a different opinion Lauren but I do think it is part of the thing is that we would always look at it in a number of years time and think right that needs a refresh now and we need to look at it again um, and think about doing the process again. Yeah I think uh, the videos once they're made they're made and we unfortunately can't tweak them that easily but all of our digital resources will be made in a kind of template format where we can get into them so if for whatever reason a certain colour for example went out of style we could go in and change it change fonts all that kind of thing so we're trying to make things as editable as possible but with some of the more fixed resources like videos we will probably have to return to them uh, as time goes on. And another one from Lindsay Blanford, really interesting thank you, how do you currently promote resources to A-level students? Yeah <laughs> that's a hard <laughs> question again, it's really hard because there's loads of different skills so there's different ways and it is part of the thing that we're going to have a marketing um, policy aren't we really in terms of like both um, schools and undergrad students as well so how we get it out and it will be very very different between the two so things that we're thinking about at the moment is obviously we've got twitter we've got newsletters that go out seasonally and things like that we also have just talking to um the teachers who come in for our taught sessions we also offer taught sessions for schools and teachers do talk to each other so it is a case that it's like we haven't promoted it it's just word of mouth that that's grown and grown and growing that side of things but we are also thinking that we might because we want to like launch it as a website don't we, with all the different resources on there. So we might actually work with our student recruitment team and we might go out and do assemblies and things like that. It's much more difficult because you haven't got a set audience in the same way that you have with a university. So you do need to get out there really is what we're thinking when we're actually getting to that stage of it. So at the moment it is um, and possibly some conferences, school librarians is another one that we're looking at. So we're working with the school librarians and things like that, but there's not an easy fix would be my take on it. Anything to do with schools, it's like going and you can't even go through the LEAs now because they're all different academies and stuff. So it's sort of like it is, it's much more difficult that side. And then one last question from Ian, would you extend or adapt this for international students too or is there something separate for international students? We've had conversations about this already. I think the, the remit and the funding behind the current project, we have to stay fixed with uh, home uh, UK A-levels. And I think that's the way this project will go for the for the two years. Um, but we've had at previous conferences and across the university, uh, quite a lot of interest in what we're doing. Uh, and I think, yeah, there's, there's conversations about that to be had in future as a potential extension on the project. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much, guys, and thanks for answering those questions as well. So we'll move on to our, the first of our lightning talks now. Uh, Uniskills goes high flex from Adam Paxman and Claire Olson.
Um, hi everyone, I'm Adam, my co-presenter Claire and I are academic skills advisors in the student engagement team or SET uh, at Edge Hill University. Uh, this lightning talk will detail a pilot scheme we ran to test out high flex delivery, that's hybrid synchronous in-person and synchronous online delivery with the option of asynchronous engagement. Um, next slide. Um, so during the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, SET piloted its in-person UniSkills workshops program, online asynchronous webinars. Workshop uptake substantially increased when offered online, uh, with the restrictions of physical room capacities removed, workshop bookings increased by 197%. Uh, the synchronous online delivery mode allowed SET to engage a much wider student audience. The HyFlex pilot was proposed by Helen Jameson, who's here today, uh, head of student uh, experience. Um, engagement, I've written it down wrong on this, that's why I said it wrong. Uh, student engagement, that's us. <laughs> uh, its aim was to investigate the viability of HyFlex delivery. Um, of existing or purpose designed workshops specifically for our uni skills purposes, which is one off rather than curriculum based significantly. Next slide, please. Um, I, I, oh. We've got a screen freeze. Technical problem. Um, okay. Thanks for that. Um, I carried out, uh, carried out a literature review, the aims of which were threefold, to establish a definition of HyFlex to determine if it can be used or adapted for uni skills purposes as part of this um, uh, two session pilot, to investigate which pedagogies are effective for use in HyFlex teaching and learning, um, and to gain an understanding of learning technologies and any other supportive practical aspects to implement and enhance high-flex session delivery. Importantly, high-flex delivery would ensure a level of equity for all students, regardless of how they chose to attend, uh, improving the accessibility of our services. This equity was challenged by modality bias, a preference for one type of delivery over another. Um, the Quality Assurance Agency's cautious uh, analysis of high flexes learning mode choice for students as a benefit um, and its potential overburdening of students with choice as a disadvantage was insightful as we began to explore apps and learning technologies for greater interactivity. These would need to be accessible, quick to learn and easy to use. Yes. Um, so what became clear when compiling the literature was asynchronous delivery in a true high flex mode, rather than providing a recording and session slides after the event, was a significant hurdle to overcome in terms of staffing and delivery. This led to the investigation and evaluation of several different learning technologies with the institution's digital training manager. At a progress meeting, it was made clear a best fit approach for uni skills as a service was more important than a strict adherence to the high flex model. Communication moderated via chat meant a busy session might also benefit from an additional staff member being present or indeed a student advisor. Okay, so moving on to some of the challenges we faced whilst conducting our high flex pilot. I'm just going to show you some of the spaces we used. Um, so the first challenge we faced pretty much was in regard to where we were going to physically deliver the sessions from. Um, so you can see here we've got two rooms, we've got Oak and Willow, which are rooms that we use for our standard um, uni skills and in-person workshops. And we've got a bit of a different setup 
And you can see there that you know, the willow room down the bottom, grouped desks, so they've each got their own screen that they can work around, great for discussion. Um, and there's also a point tilt zoom camera that's available in that room, so it'll track the presenter. And um, so anybody accessing online will see that. Whereas the oak room at the top that you can see is banks of desks, so much more for PC access, really. It's a large presenting space with that main computer at the front, but there is no point tilt or zoom camera in that space. And um, so it is literally having to sit in front of the monitor and deliver from there. So two totally different spaces, really, in terms of a high flex delivery. Um, and, you know, when we were discussing as to which, which one we wanted to actually use, it was a case of, you know, well, what is going to offer the students the, the best option, really. And whilst we would have loved the space with the PTZ camera, ultimately we thought, actually, we need to have that computer access, students accessing online, and also those in person still had to access the computer activities too. So we opted for the Oak Room. Okay, also, so the second challenge that we were facing as well was obviously parity of experience. So we, as, um, as I'm just saying, we wanted to create a true high flex um, opportunity for everyone to get involved really, but that wasn't always as easy as we thought it might be. So whilst we feel that our activities and opportunity for the discussion and questions and answers were developed with this fully in mind, we found that students still didn't truly engage as much as they could have done, uh, which I'll come on to a little bit more in a bit as well. So in this sense, HyFlex really suffered the same fate as both of our online and in-person workshops, really. You just can't always rely on the students to want to get involved, even if you're putting all those opportunities out there for them. Uh, we also found that our booking system posed many a challenge as well, in that we had to create separate booking events for students wanting to attend either synchronously online or synchronously in person. So we couldn't just create the one event um, and let the student choose when booking how they'd like to attend. So if we're looking at it from a true high flex experience, the students should be able to just book their place and then decide on the day how they're going to attend and they've got you know, both options there for them. And um, our system wouldn't allow for this currently. And um, so instead they were making the choice at booking. And uh, we were also unable to offer a booking system for students who wanted to access any of the materials asynchronously. So, you know, in their own time, basically. And uh, this wasn't requested, so no students actually asked it from us anyway. But had it been, we'd have to have manually replied to that via email. Um, by far, though, our largest challenge was student bookings or limited student bookings, as we've got on there, and um, which obviously then impacted on attendance. So during the first pilot, we had 61 students book, but only 13 attended. And then out of this figure, we had no students actually attend in person. They were all online. Um, the second time we ran this as well, the second pilot, 16 students booked and 17 attended. And this time we did have a mix of students attending both online and in person. However, and interestingly, when asked, the students were unaware that they'd booked a high flex workshop, even though we had all of the, um, the language around that and the explanation of what it was they were booking, they still very much saw it as either an online or in-person workshop space that they were booking. And then finally, as already touched on, it was just a lack of student interaction did make some sessions difficult. So in particular, one session had one in-person student attend whilst everybody else was online. Um, and the in-person student didn't want to get involved you know, for whatever reason and um, communicating either in the room so in person or also all of the online opportunities as well and um, via padlets and chat room boxes things like that so it was really difficult to encourage the, the physical classroom in that space whilst also engaging with any of the students online as well so what worked well then so like i said we talked about some of the challenges that we did face um, but lots of, lots of good stuff came out of our HyFlex pilot as well. So working with colleagues to obviously understand what HyFlex was all about and how we were going to adapt our planning and our delivery and our teaching space in this as well meant close working in the team. So the delivery of the HyFlex sessions required two members of staff at all times. We always had to make sure there were two, one to lead and one to monitor those channels um, just to check that we're, we were communicating with everybody. So we definitely suggest if you've not tried HyFlex before and you want to, make sure you've got a willing teammate uh, to co-deliver. Uh, we also need to rely more on the wider support than we perhaps normally do. Um, so our helpful IT and AV support manager provided some really useful information about the, the spaces that we, we normally access anyway, but just in a different way. Um, and the demos and things that he provided were really useful. Um, and perhaps the greatest takeaway from our HyFlex pilot has been trialing different technologies within our sessions. So whilst we did use Padlet and VBox previous to our HyFlex pilot, um, it tends to be more intermittently and it was activities that were slotted into um, sessions 
rather than with the high flex pad that we really anchored it um, amidst a, a padlet so to speak so all of the activities and a lot of communication took place through that and um, so in in a sense it was that you know allowing that space for discussion but also we could use that as a resource then that we could send to students afterwards um, and then finally you know, running the high flex sessions did make us appreciate the offer that our day-to-day -day offer that we currently run um, and in many ways you know, we don't necessarily feel the need to necessarily run high flex sessions um, a student have fed back to the surveys and the evaluation that we've done but they just they want to be able to choose whether they're attending online in person as long as they're doing that they don't necessarily need the of this some of the um, comments that we received back from some of the evaluation um, and like I said you know, they're just basically appreciative of being able to attend either online or in person and they didn't necessarily realise that there was an option really at the time of booking. They thought they were either booking the option of either or, um, and this, like I said, is already something available within our uni sales programme. So just to read out some of the comments, um, one student said, I like how convenient the workshop is, and the high flex form. Well, that you know that you, 10 minutes is up. Oh, <laughs> thank you, that's fine. Yeah, you can obviously see this, that we've got our um, comments very quickly. We ran over the future. Um, full potential still unknown, as you can see, it's a small scale project, even though it, we ran two pilots, the numbers would need to be bigger for us to evaluate it more. Um, ourselves, the academic skills advisors, practice needs to gain our confidence when delivering those sessions as well would be definitely useful. There is a, definitely potential for increased admins, that's something else to consider from the back end of this side of things as well. But we have noticed that yeah, our use of Padlet and Vivox has been really useful and something we've developed further now in other sessions too. And the big thing, the main takeaway from this is students ultimately want the option of attending either online or in person, and they're happy as long as they can do that. But we can also see the benefit of that for ongoing teaching, perhaps rather than stand up in one-off sessions. And this is just to kind of summarise, really, we are interested to know if anyone else has had any high flex um, experiences. We've got the good, the bad, the ugly there. You're more than welcome to scan our QR codes and add in any of your comments. You'd find that really useful and obviously it'll be available on the slides once you download them afterwards too. Well, thank you very much. Apologies for going slightly over. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll ask questions when uh, we've heard from the, the second lightning talk. Thank you, uh, Adam and Claire. So now we're moving on to how we created a wellbeing space in the University of Leeds libraries from Julie Langley and Eddie Whitaker. Hi. Hi there. Let's share our presentation. So, hi there, my name is Jilly. Welcome to our presentation. I'm going to talk to you about how we created a wellbeing space in the University of Leeds Libraries. I'm joined by Eddie. Hi everyone. We both work in Leeds University Libraries in customer services, and we are both passionate about student wellbeing and customer service. Our wellbeing team has grown. It now includes staff members from every library site here on campus. Anybody showing an interest, we welcome with open arms into the team. And some of the team, including myself, have taken part in a week's uh, UX training course run by Andy Priestner. So just moving on, our next slide shows who our stakeholders are. And following this, uh, you can see a slide that's showing our aim. So originally, I became keen to develop a wellbeing space in our libraries. This was after attending the CSG UK conference in February of the 2019, which was pre-pandemic. Um, as many university libraries at that time had wellbeing offers, that included blankets, calm spaces, book collections. I came back kind of quite fueled up to provide something at Leeds. This turned out very um, small in the beginning. It was just some colouring, which we provided during the exam sessions. Um, so I'll just move on. Our objectives were in, these, these are in place really for us to be able to develop our space. Um, and I'll just pass you on to Eddie to tell you a bit about how we've gone about putting things into place. So this is our UX funding slide and uh, in spring of last year, the University Library announced there'd be a user experience fund 
um, where staff members could bid for money for user experience improvement. Uh, Gilly, uh, Gilly suggested we sort of bid for money for a wellbeing space and together we put in a bid for this and the idea was the money could help us set up a prototype wellbeing space here in Edward Boyle Library. And Gilly will tell you uh, why. So why? The pandemic changed everything. As we know, it's been mentioned a few times today, teaching, exams took place online and for a few months our study spaces were closed. The library customer service team worked from home and the online support was invaluable to our customers. Um, however, after the pandemic, customers have been left struggling with mental health. Um, the Being Well, Doing Well survey of November 2022 backs this up. The survey was run by Student Minds and Alter Line. Uh, 1,037 students were asked about their mental health and worryingly one in three of those surveyed have poor mental health. It became quite clear that the library needed to support students with their well-being and that this was instrument, this is an instrumental part of why we've wanted to put something more in place. In the article, Top Trends in Academic Libraries, which can be found in the June 2020 edition of College and Research Library News, Benedetti and colleagues wrote that libraries are a safe space. So traditionally, unions have provided wellbeing resources for students, as our libraries are frequently visited by students and thought of as a safe space, I feel it's essential libraries play a pivotal role in supporting student wellbeing. I'll just pass on to Eddie for what we did. So the uh, so you can hear, see here, um, the bid for UX money was successful. We Ooh. actually received a thousand pounds, which was we used to, to help develop a prototype. And in this space, we used chairs and tables from other areas of the library, we sort of begged, borrowed and stolen from everywhere. And we bought Lego, yoga mats, colour and materials, craft, origami paper, printed Sudoku, a couple of bean bags were donated, we've subscribed to the Happy newspaper, and we'd really like to develop a wellbeing book collection going forward, like Sheffield and uh, University of Westminster have so wonderfully. So the next slide shows us the scope. So these uh, the UX techniques that we used, um, such as guerrilla interviews, for example, we use those to gather feedback to further back up the need for a permanent space. So I'll just pass you on to Jilly to show you our wellbeing word cloud. As you can see, some of the common themes in the word cloud from the wellbeing gathered, um, which we have acted upon, particularly plants, Absolutely. comes up the most. Um, this is just an overview of our Padlet, which Eddie will just talk you through. So the, the research uh, and feedback um, we received, um, we did through surveys such as Microsoft Form, guerrilla interviews in person, and that evidence we collected it was fantastically useful um, at customer feedback. So all the customers that we spoke to are really keen to have some well-being sort of dedicated space. So we all the feedback we get, we add to this uh, feedback uh, feedback padlet, which uh, we're continuing to do. Um, and we most recently added feedback during the exam sessions where we run a, a series of well-being pop-up uh, kind of sessions and uh, uh, things like colouring, for example, within our libraries. So the uh, f following this, uh, this slide shows you the, the purchases that we've um, made the um, following feedback. Um, so these are customer driven purchases. So you can see Lego, you can see the uh, yoga mat, you can see lots of greenery. All these things are coming up time and time again. Um, and in uh, also um, we actually did receive um, the donated sort of bean bags. Uh, they needed uh, rebeaning, so one of the purchases we got were the actual beans, which seems incredibly uh, easy in theory, but uh, didn't quite go according to plan. There was a, a lot of mess, beans everywhere. I'm not uh, thinking of it's a it's a career choice for me, but absolutely fantastic for staff wellbeing as well as student wellbeing and the, the bean bags are much used so well worth it. So on our next slide you can see students actually using the space 
and um, exactly which is fantastic to see on the left hand side you've got students looking incredibly happy sort of sitting there making a space their own then um, in the middle we can see a, a customer who came in really stressed during our recent exams um, she found the space having remembered seeing it started seeing some yoga and having come in very stressed out she left smiling fantastic and the the other the other picture you can see is uh of the actual space uh here at the edmund Boyle. so um here we have links for our padlet and our microsoft form if you did want to go and have a look and uh you can actually see the padlet which we continue to uh update and also the microsoft form which has uh questions and you'll also be able to see the actual feedback itself we use open-ended questions such as, what would you like to see in a wellbeing space? We didn't actually wanted it to be completely customer led, um, which is in line with uh, UX research guidelines. And I'll just pass you over to uh, to, to Jilly to tell, tell you about our visits to Sheffield University. So growing more keen by the day, we decided to branch out and go for a visit. So in July last year, we visited Sheffield University. Their garden room has recently been completed. It comes up if you Google um, wellbeing spaces in university libraries. Um, this was incredibly inspiring. Um, we then attended a couple of online sessions. One was wellbeing in academic libraries. Three of the group, including myself, um, learned quite a lot about how to um, build the build the space, things that worked, things that didn't. E.g., like they have a yellow chair at Westminster, and it's part of each of their wellbeing areas, and it kind of draws students to know that that's their space. So, taking things like that on board. Um, moving on, we've got our pop-up spaces, which were a recent addition in these recent exam period. The spaces will now stay in situ. We moved four large purple chairs to each side and table. We added a, a box that was called the wellbeing box. We popped Sudoku and colouring stuff in them. And each week, once a week, each each site stashed, we staffed four sessions at the same time in each site. So we ran colouring, we ran spirograph, origami. Some of the amazing feedback was we saw the colouring and thought, why not? We were really tired and just wanted to power on through a break. So doing this is really good. My, one of my favourite is from the origami sessions, which again, I don't think Eddie and I have got a career in origami, do you, Eddie? So, no. However, some of our <laughs> customers are particularly good and they made love hearts. Um, we did have some little templates, so they, they made the love hearts and they put little messages on and took them up to their friends who were not having a break to give them a positive boost. It kind of warmed our hearts. Absolutely. So what's next, Eddie? Well, um, we then made a bid to the senior leadership team asking for the pause space to be made into a permanent space. And the bid was approved, and for we were the bid was for fifty thousand pounds. We intend to use this to buy furniture, create proper branding, and roll this out to all sites eventually. It, this will future proof this for generations of students to come. There'll be flexible design that can adapt to changing user feedback. And plans are in the early stages, but uh, we do hope to get an architect uh, soon, uh, although they're yet to be appointed. We intend to gain I, I, more. I, 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 Sorry, we've oh, got sorry. one minute, one minute. We intend to gain more user really? feedback, UX feedback from all stakeholders, sorry, as we start the new term. And this is something we'll repeat on a termly basis. Their idea is to create Spotify playlist, create a wellbeing collection of books, collaborate with new makerspace, run, uh, which is here at Everball, run workshops and bring external people in to run events. Um, so maybe like a meditation or guide dogs. Uh, and we're also talking about possibly having a wellbeing cafe. And finally, the last slide is here to inspire you. We hope you are inspired. The library investment in providing UX training here at Leeds has been invaluable, obtaining future investment as we learn how to gather and record feedback. We'd like to thank the rest of the ever-growing wellbeing team for their belief in our ideas. The project reused furniture and we just used free resources online with the addition of some Lego, initially costing just under £200 to create the first space. 
a well-being space in your library or department can be done on a very small budget with a bit of creativity and is so appreciated by the students that use it. Let's make libraries and places of academic study lighter and a place of reflection and enjoyment as well as academic endeavour. We hope you are inspired. Go grab those bean bags, refill them. I want to see the photographs. We hope you have more success than we did and with with the refilling and we are constantly inspired by other institutions well-being initiatives and this is why we're here today so thank you for listening to our to our talk and if you want to contact us our details are here we'd be happy to discuss what we've done in more detail with anybody who's interested thanks everyone thanks very much Julie and Eddie uh, great presentation two great lightning talks there uh, just very quickly because we are slightly running over time there is one question about um do you have any concerns about spending money when providing resources such as lego um and then they disappear so how's that happened so very quickly could you answer that um it's not disappeared i thought it might and i was a bit worried about it but initially we were given a thousand pounds and we didn't have much time to spend the thousand pounds in fact we didn't even spend it all and um, but most of the lego is still there so i did i did worry about it but it's there the felt pens do go walk about but i think it's because they run out of pens and they just grab them and walk off with them okay thank you very much uh, so that concludes uh, session two uh, thanks very much to our presenters Next up in the main room is the keynote speech, Organising for Change, 